Okay. Um, I'm really excited here to have uh, Roundhouse Platform. Uh, Roundhouse Platform is a collaboration between designers, educators, and curators, Noemi de Plan-Lichter and Brendan Shea, dedicated to investigating cycles of change in architectural production and the perception, documentation, and preservation of site-specific histories. Their workshops, curatorial projects, and urban labs have been supported by Wikipedia, LAS Subject, USC Special Collections, and WUHO. Noemi is currently a teaching fellow at the School of Architecture and a visiting instructor and editor of CROP, the school publication for Texas Tech University. Noemi previously worked at, uh, in education at the Canadian Center for Architecture and Archives at the Getty Research Institute, as well as in teach, uh, teaching at the University of Southern California, uh, Otis Redding School of Art and Woodbury University. She holds an MA in Curatorial Studies from the University of Southern California and, M and an MARC from McGill University and a BA in Art History from Concordia University. Brendan is currently a research fellow at the School of Architecture. He is creator of Reimaging, a practice and platform that cultivates representational futures for architectural production and a co-founder of 2426, a space in Los Angeles that combines the production and exhibition of new art and architectural works. He holds a BA in architectural studies from UCLA and an MRC from Princeton University. Welcome, Noemi and Brendan. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. We have prepared a few slides to visually introduce uh, our presentation. We're uh, super happy to be here. Yes, so uh, Roundhouse Platform, uh, this is us. We do design, research, teaching uh, for today's presentation. We've been over all of this. Today's presentation is uh, titled Site Info Info Site. And um, I'll introduce some of the work that I do. Brennan will introduce some of his and then we'll describe how the two practices come together uh, uh, as part of Roundhouse Platform, specifically looking at this team of uh, site info info site. Some of the precedents just to situate our practice in the discipline that we've been looking at are the Olgier brothers on the left hand side working on the thermoheliodon and a kind of a climatic model uh, developed in the 60s at the Princeton um, Research Lab. In the center you see Ralph Knowles who was working at USC with the Natural Forces Lab again modeling the extra architectural effects, but also modeling kind of natural systems as part using architectural tools. You see them working on uh, sand formations down in the image in the lower middle. Also, we've been thinking about the relationship between other mediums that uh, architects intersect with, like writing. So you see Allison Knowles on the right hand side, who was one of the first people to write computational poetry. It also got translated into built architectural work. So you see the House of Dust project where a printout of the poem uh, got dropped at the opening of the architectural installation on the lower right hand side. This is a collective uh, I was part of in Montreal called Point View Points of View that was uh, studying a specific site around the city through a workshop, guided tour, and exhibition. This particular exhibition is looking at the Wellington Tower, which was an old switching tower in Montreal that we uh, activated, including its surrounding, through a series of workshop and guided tour. That's uh, uh, an example of me leading a guided tour, looking at the self-seeded uh, vegetation on site or the weeds. And that's um, the outcomes of the participants who created a post-industrial herbariums of um, press weeds and botanical uh, drawings as well. Um, some other aspects of the way that I conduct research and teach is really uh, focusing on um, primary sources, uh, either it be within the gallery setting or a more uh, archival setting. This is an example of an open archive or white glove party that was hosted. Uh, looking at uh, architectural uh, and engineering drawings of another switching tower actually behind me, but this time in Los Angeles, uh, California. Uh, other example of uh, looking at archives of specific um, sites. 
here are the collection of the Getty Research Institute. We have every sunset, every building on Sunset Strips uh, archive uh, as part of a, a class that I taught. So looking at site-specific histories through primary sources material. If Noemi is kind of coming from a background of thinking of site as a source of information, I'm, I'm kind of bringing the lens of information as a kind of site to work with as a medium for architects. This work started in Princeton in my thesis project in 2014 in a project called Performing Fabrication, which I worked collaboratively with Gabriel Fries Briggs and Nicholas Pajerski to rethink the role of fabrication for the discipline of architecture. Fabrication, not just as a form of production, but also as a form of representation. The project intersected performance with video, with code, with model making. Um, in order to expand the possibilities for representation tied to fabrication. You'll see some of our work um, is, was a lot about kind of rethinking the moment of making and how the model could be mediated through various forms of technology, whether that was the video, the software, the, the kind of overlay of drawing on top of uh, a live video stream. And so it was this kind of time-based media that was really important to the development of the project. But also another layer, the kind of starting layer, was to rethink the role of the machine, you know, the machines that can update and respond in real time. So we produced a series. Each machine performed one action, one kind of action of fabrication, whether that was stacking, tilting, piling, or helping us shape a bunch of pores. Um, and tied to the machines were these actions and softwares that uh, oh, sorry, there sounded this one, which I didn't expect. <laughs> but yeah, we the the kind of working in real time was mediated by codes that were written to produce drawings and and kind of feedback between the models and the act of making in real time. The models that came out of this, they were trying to teeter this line between totally formal and totally formless. So you see that there are these kind of contingent materials that were important in the investigation, whether that was something that was a phase change material like plaster or something that had variable characteristics like foam that was either rigid or squishy. It, the kind of counterpart to that contingency was working with architectural conventions like the unit, you know, the square, the block, or the joint, you know, the way that we could calibrate um, very precisely for parts to come together, whether that's these legs in the three or four configuration or the way that the plaster and the units met each, each other in the kind of towers you see on the right hand side. The visuals look like this, the kind of act of making was the site that was documented by the drawings. These drawings were produced by codes that were written ahead of time. So really these weren't drawings that were used to make the models, but rather visualizations that describe the dynamics of interacting with materials and interacting with other people in a 2D format. And one of the final formats was video, right? Documenting the models and using them as kind of speculative devices, giving them a scale in relation to the human body or an architectural typology. That work led into uh, re-imaging the practice that I run with uh, Gabriel and Nick, and we've worked at a variety of scales from the furniture scale up to the urban proposal scale, installations, prints, drawings, um, models, all these things kind of in between. Um, that work also has really driven a lot of the approaches I take towards teaching and teaching information and kind of site-based thinking. Um, toolkits are a big part of that, so just teaching different uh, technologies, like here at Texas Tech, working with the six-axis robotic arm to do a 2D Sharpie drawing workshop, or when COVID set and we couldn't access the shop anymore, having the students send the script to me and run them on a tiny robot in my uh, apartment, you know? <laughs> It's the flip side of doing that. Um, that teaching also often happens in these really expedited um, fashions. Like these are some of the summer toolkits I was teaching at the University of Southern California, which are one week classes to introduce modeling, drawing, and animation skills to the student body. Um, the, the work there was tied to the eyes of ideas of reimaging in that the, um, the mediums were, instead of being held separate, all kind of synthesized together to produce this kind of more synthetic working environment between an animation and a model and a drawing. 
exhibition and curation is a huge part of that, you know, developing a kind of shared language for the incoming student body. So how that work is curated, displayed, and maybe most importantly, how there becomes this social dimension, a kind of conversation around issues of representation is super important and leads us to the next step where Noemi yeah. and I really met. Yeah, 2426 is a, a, a space we co-ran in, in Los Angeles, a, a space for the uh, production and exhibition of architecture. So a very uh, modular and ever-changing ever uh, space. This is an example of uh, a more typical uh, gallery show, but we had architectural review, we had people build installations, uh, host events. So this is uh, kind of a, an example of what a typical day uh, at 2426 would look like from it being used as an office for just a, a few of us um, to uh, hosting a class of students. If I remember correctly, those are older students that were uh, from the communication um, arts um, department and looking for a venue to host their uh, end of the year uh, show, which ended up happening a couple of uh, months later. So they were just there to measure and, and prepare the exhibition design. Uh, some of the other aspects, uh, other things that uh, we did at 2426, uh, we had a beautiful courtyard for round tables, uh, interviews, uh, different types of workshop, more typical uh, gallery shows uh, uh, as well. Uh, on the right is an exhibition um, that's the outcome of a research trip that I took with uh, Erika Brandon-Mouton uh, and Jessica Charbonneau. The exhibition is called Lado a Lado, and it's um, studying the vernacular architecture on both sides of the Mexican-American uh, border. So uh, when it comes to uh, Roundhouse, uh, it, it, if 2426 is like a physical space, Roundhouse is a cultural platform in the sense that uh, we have been um, moving and, and uh, going different places, uh, doing teaching, research, and curation with it. The initial project we worked on together in Roundhouse was geared at um, understanding and investigating a kind of a formal space, one that wasn't either formless or formal, but was something that kind of existed at a scale larger than architecture and slightly outside of architectural terms. It was called infrastructural imaginary and it was the kind of careful study of a former industrial classification yard along the Los Angeles River. We ran a series of workshops there that Noemi curated um, with a series of guest experts. We went to the same site and documented its kind of liminal state through three different lenses. First, investigating the plants of the site and how they acted as a piece of evidence. Second, looking at the remains of buildings, the kind of ruins and slabs that were there and had accreted over a hundred years of element and last but not least we took participants there and had them map their experiences of the site through a series of psychogeographic prompts and then um, drawings and sketches that were notating their embodied experience of the site so the, the infrastructural imaginary project yeah introduced this idea or leaned on the model of the urban lab that noemi had developed really studying a kind of place for its history um you see in some of the photographs that these were collective participatory events really open to anyone all walks of life but we got architects landscape architects theorists and also just people from the neighborhood who are interested in learning more about a place um in addition to kind of collecting things from the site like plants, um, we also looked at the kind of representational history of the place, like how there was this archive of information in the engineering drawings related to this site. And so you see those all on the bottom layer. Some of those things we built up our own archive of and we were then able to teach and inform people about the history of the site. Other things we were more interested in Kind of bringing this collapse between the representation and the real things. So we printed out one-to-one -one scale drawings and brought them to the site so that people could um, try to guess where they were at in the drawing when they were in the real space. And there was this kind of big gap that was ex exposed in that process. The urban lab model, yes, we it's a kind of re repeated model. So asks us to go back to the site over and over again. And these were walks that we, once we had curated them, we performed them in a variety of contexts from our own workshops to a walk for a group called SPAN. 
We did a river walk about the whole history of Los Angeles as you moved across the river. We did it with the Cal Poly Landscape Architecture Department. And we also then brought people to the exhibited materials and kind of walked them through the exhibited materials as well as the site itself. So uh, one of the shows of some of this material looked like this and the collection of displayed material looked like this. The archival drawings were on loan and pinned up directly on the wall, along with popular press, it's like kind of media about the site. You see in these little yellow panels in the images on the left hand side that had uh, newspaper headlines, the journal articles, even the articles that the train company ran about their own uh, <laughs> operations were on display. And so we could tell a fuller story in addition to the engineering and blueprint blueprints that you see in the image on the right hand side they were pinned up using um <clears throat> magnets no uh, archival material was perforated in this show <laughs> okay. this is a site site it's a um a lecture we gave a series of videos we created and a workshop we gave for the escuela ripe de arquitectura in tijuana uh, in 2018, so we brought back this similar model of uh, the urban lab to a completely different uh, setting, specifically um, uh, downtown uh, Tijuana and the uh, border um, uh, crossing region uh, of Tijuana, as well as the classroom of uh, the Escuela Libre de Arquitectura, where the student process some of their finding and research from the fieldwork into uh, our, uh, architectural uh, representation. Horizon made out of wool is, uh, again, a similar uh, way of uh, studying uh, site and collecting information using technology as well. This was uh, done for uh, Space Saloon, which is a design build festival uh, in the desert. And um, we had um, a kind of performative walk where we um, unroll a mile of string studying the concept of the um, Jefferson Square Mile uh, that is so shaping of the American landscape and seeing what type of uh, legacy it has in uh, remain in the landscape. And then students use uh, their cell phone to um, code some of the information that was collected, including uh, distances and the blueness of the sky. Um, and there was a knitting component, component as well, looking as kind of a binary system that is analog or uh, precedent for uh, so, some type of coding. So the research that was done um, was kind of uh, the outcome or the presentation of it was twofold. On the left, you have a website that documents this Jefferson square mile of one mile per one mile and the different point, points of where we were able to collect data. The data that was collected was uh, looking at the blueness of the sky and the greenness of the ground. Uh, the name of the workshop was Lost Horizon, so horizon being between the ground and, and the sky and looking at both ends and creating this horizon. And then on the right is the more uh, analog version of the outcomes where you have flash drives that have all of the data on them and then um, uh, stripes of paint that are based on the RGB value uh, of the blueness of the sky every day that we collected, and then a scale that presents the graininess um, of the, the ground every uh, location that we were at. Yeah, the last project was treating the environment as a source of information, and then this project may be treating information as a kind of environment in its own right. This is a series of Wikipedia editathons called Architecture and Feminism we've been running, part of a global international movement sponsored by Art and Feminism to address the gender gap in both the uh, information available on Wikipedia and also the uh, kind of editors of Wikipedia. You know, it's predominantly male in both categories, and that's something that we're seeking to remediate from an architectural lens. We've done the event at a variety of different institutions over the last couple years. The events, they invite people from all walks of life to learn more about Wikipedia and learn more about this kind of bias that's built into our data, but then also to act upon it and contribute something, some piece of research that they've done about a woman, a woman or trans or any, really anyone who's um, not represented yet on Wikipedia 
by editing an article or uploading uh, images that would address that bias. Public programming is another uh, project, ongoing project of ours that has happened uh, in Los Angeles, at Wuhol Gallery, uh, at Texas Tech, um, and in other venues. But with the, the principle of public programming is even finding emerging uh, uh, designers to remix archival material using contemporary uh, software and coding. So uh, that's true music, uh, true uh, visual remixing, and true uh, installation as well. The premise of the series is that each designer is invited to choose a city and build up their own archive of that city, a variety of narratives, whether they're acoustic or visual, whether they're coming from things like a housing authority or a photographic archive or a movie that pertains to that city. So they, this kind of um, framework allows people to expand their narratives around cities and present that in a way that's engaging to a public and usually young contemporary audience. <laughs> Um, we've had people come from the video game world to do it, from the architecture world, really from all walks of life. But that leads us to our next project, kind of linking that idea of archiving in place to a form of teaching. This is the Learning from Lubbock seminar we ran when we first arrived in Texas Tech in the city of Lubbock in the panhandle of Texas, a place that was wholly unfamiliar to us. Uh, we took the opportunity to study it with students. So each of them chose a filter, a kind of lens, a framework to study the city from, whether that's water, land, uh, bricks, just the color of the place. Um, and they did this kind of intensive um, documentation of that place before creating us a, a toolkit to take us out into the field. They would lead us on a walk and they would ask us to collect the piece of data that could help them grow their archive of the place. So you see them developing their own tools and then leading this kind of data collection exercise. There's a pedagogical moment in there where the student becomes the teacher, but also all of the other students become the data collectors and everyone kind of switches roles a little bit in that moment. Um, the final phase of that was looking at ways that um, there could be this synthetic form of representation where documented videos or photographs from the site were used in conjunction with a kind of standard model making technique that you might see in a studio, whether that's brick stacking or painting or digging, or I don't know if you trim your plants in your studio, but that's what you see one of the students doing here. So there's this kind of back and forth using green screen to show a real place, but also to represent it through another um, studio technique. Um, in our built work, we've been working with IV um, on this project AgHab, a kind of on, is a prototypical eco dwelling is what we've called it, but it's an ongoing form of research about, uh, you know, regenerative architecture, really working on developing an ecologically friendly model from recycled materials and a site derived approach to designing and building a piece of architecture. This is built for the Oaks Creek Ranch in the Panhandle of Texas over the course of two weeks. And it results in this uh, piece of architecture that's at once heavy and light. It's made of the earth and it's made of this kind of um, material that is left over usually from construction or exists in architecture schools in abundance, which is uh, recycled paper. So you see that here. I think we should move forward so we have a chance yeah, to, to go and the project started with uh, with digging uh, robotic digging studies which helped us to determine the series of material tests casting paper inside of those holes this is the process for fabrication in both diagram and photograph the glue in the project is an eco adhesive so it's all recyclable and the lifespan of the project was extremely short really it lasted two weeks before it collapsed back into the hole and then the prairie retook over the site okoboji teaching collection this is part of the lakeside art lab artists in residence that we did over the summer where we used the teaching collection of this science lab to create a card game uh, and a series of uh, representation, coded representation of the data from the collection. So this is a coded representation of the um, uh, collecting patterns from that institution, depending on the type of uh, collections. 
And I think this is it. Yeah, Recently yeah. we're here, we're at the School of Architecture, we're working again on um, looking at site understanding as a source of information, and that'll be translated into a show in the spring. Yes. So thank you so much. That's all our slides for now. Great. Um, thanks so much for sharing your work. Um, it's, it's incredibly interesting. I, th I have a, a question maybe about formality and convention. Um, obviously, I think there's a desire here to break convention or, or maybe experiment, tweak conventions, um, and maybe play with um, contemporary media or leverage contemporary media um, as a way to kind of comment on a, the, the hermetic um, media approaches of architecture, right? There's this idea that, that drawings should be drawings, um, but I think all of the drawings that you are all producing are not necessarily sort of architectural conventions. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, where that might come from and um, why do you feel it's necessary to, to experiment with such a wide array of um, media from computation to archival approaches to, um, you know, public data sets and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, an, it, we have at times a, an interest in uh, uh, looking very carefully and closely at conventions of drawings uh, through archival material, but it's always to uh, question where they're coming from and how they're being constructed. And I think that the diversity of medium that we use and teach is is uh, having a, a similar attempt at, at questioning some of those uh, convention and and uh, uh, yeah questioning where they're coming from uh, who who they're serving who they're disserving what type of history I know oral history is a very important part of the research we do and obviously uh, oral history is um, a method uh, from historians that are trying to um, uh, uncover histories from minorities that have been typically excluded from the a large, uh, larger narrative. So uh, I think in a similar way, we're, we're trying to use a diversity of, of method to uncover uh, uh, practices that are at time excluded from the kind of hegemonic architectural practice. Um, and this cultivate our interest in, in kind of exploring so many different modes of representation. Yeah, I think another thing I would add is that both site and information come with explicit biases. You know, one of the, the ways, the kind of conventional practices of understanding site in architecture is doing something like the grand tour, which is incredibly biased based on race, class, ability to travel, gender, gender. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. a female right. perspective. <laughs> but like if, when, we, when we think about site, right, that baggage that comes along with it, that's part of the disciplinary and professional history is just something that we can't accept outright, but we can be critical of, or we could be kind of playful in rethinking and, and bringing in new audiences and bringing new approaches. I think the same thing can be said for information. We all know that technology has bias built inside of it. And to not be aware of that, to not be challenging it, critiquing it, trying something new, or at least exposing um, that there are these kind of tendencies inside of technology and information is, is a hard position to hold. So yeah, we, we try that challenge. Yeah, that's, um, that's great. And, and I see I see a lot of desire to um, engage with um, uh, let's say uh, public data sets or or data that is not necessarily uh, hidden right because i think a lot of data that, that we encounter on a daily life uh, data that is in you know smartphones or uh, computers that kind of stuff uh, a lot of it is hidden right um, or occluded and it, you know do you all have a desire to let's say expose some of that occluded data or to democratize access to that data or ownership of, of people's data? I think one thing that we've been finding is that there's a, a wealth of information and data that's part of the public domain, which is accessible to all for free, but it is not all accessible, you know, accessible is very difficult to, to uh, access. It's technically accessible, but the, so part of the curatorial practice is also trying to uncover this be, because the, just through the means of the, um, 
research tools that are needed or are sometimes unfriendly and unknown of and, and less common. Uh, they, they, it's not an easy Google search, let's say, even if it's part of the public domain. Yeah, and I, I think I, I also, you know, there's this idea of data dignity that's starting to exist and be more present in conversations around data. Oftentimes, the invisibility of how your data is used and mined by large corporations in large part is, um, yeah, is where the kind of problem comes in. It's nice having the internet. It's nice having more technology. It's nice that all this data is generated, but the invisibility of how it's extracted from from the users who are generating all of the content is where the problem arises. I think our work tries to bring more awareness to how data is collected and disseminated and in that process, hopefully make the process of, of engaging data uh, also a more dignified process, not make it so automatic, but instead insert someone like people really into that kind of process of working, sharing, collecting data. And I think we see that in the walks. I think we see that in the coding exercises, um, but also in the use of public domain material, searching it, finding it, sharing it, all of these things we hope to engage larger and larger audiences in doing. And enabling larger audiences mm -hmm. and giving a sense of agency to both uh, consume and contribute to uh, data sets and, mm -hmm. and their representation. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think, um, no, that's that's fantastic. It's It seems like also that um, uh, there's a kind of low tech approach that uh, that I'm seeing in, in a lot of the projects. Um, but then you, you also engage with uh, with, with programming um, and uh, data visualization, and and so I, I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about that that low tech approach. Um, I mean, it could be low tech, but it could also be kind of like hands on, right? I, I love this. Uh, this idea of mapping just literally by going out on a hike and then like reflecting on the colors that you see um, and using analog materials like uh, yarn and that kind of stuff. I think we're interested in studying the, the same thing at different lens and, and the, the translation to, to us, it was a direct translation between the yarn, the knitting process as a kind of binary process and the coding uh, representing or same with the the bringing the archive on site uh, at Taylor Yard and, and literally looking at a drawing and looking at a, a landscape and, and switching uh, uh, scale and, and also um, participants use their phone to geolocalize themselves. So really uh, uh, contrasting uh, low tech and high tech, but by doing the by, by studying the same thing. Yeah, and I think also we, we try to bring um, this juxtaposition into our work, this kind of contrast where things that are traditionally or conventionally thought of as low tech processes, we bring a high tech lens to them, you know, things like site study are always these moments in a studio or a project where you go and you're supposed to feel the site. It's an incredibly like low tech data poor process usually and we I think that's where a lot of this is coming from is there are other tools now that could equip us to quantify that experience and also then work with numbers and abstraction instead of just intuition. I think on the flip side, a lot of the things that are high tech, um, we try to bring a low tech lens to them, right? So the things about fabrication, you know, you see us digging a hole in the ground, but also thinking about how a robot could maybe be part of that job or maybe it's not necessary. So I think that back and forth, bringing the high tech view to the low tech aspects of architecture and the low tech view to some of the high tech kind of conversations and practices is, is at least where my head's at in the last couple of years in doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly um, sort of um, reveals how computers sort of um, computationalize us, but then we also kind of humanize computation in a way. There's a feedback loop that happens, I think. Um, I think that this sort of like a butchered quote from uh, from Catherine Hales, um, but I th I think it's very evident in in your work. Um, I think uh, I think we're out of time, but would would you like to um, introduce the the guests that you'll be bringing on next week or um, next time? Yes, we well we first we want to thank you so much. It's been uh, so great being here. We're super grateful. Uh, it's, it, for, for, for the occasion to uh, present our work and, and talk to uh, Gallo and have your perspective on it. We are inviting Stephanie Lin, who is the Dean of the School of Architecture 
uh, and will be uh, presenting uh, her work for the next episode. Yeah, we're so happy to be part of the chain of uh, presenters in Architectural Informatics Society. Thank you so much, Gallo, yeah. and uh, to the Society for inviting us. Really enjoy it. It's wonderful yeah. taking the baton and, and then passing it. It's a, such a great format. Great. Well, um, thanks so much for, for being here, and uh, I look forward to seeing the next video. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. thanks.